Advancements in recording equipment and techniques didn't initially come from large manufacturing companies or professional recording studios as one might believe, but rather were primarily inspired by the creative genius of one musician. While recording hit record after hit record in his home studio, recording artist and performer Les Paul pioneered sound experimentation and the innovations that are to this day the building blocks of modern recording. Uh, we go back to 1946, and I'm playing at the Oriental Theater in Chicago, and Mom comes down to visit me. She drives down. Now, Mom is really a swinging gal, because she died at 101 and a half. And that gal, let me tell you, she was driving her car down in Chicago in 46, so she came in and she comes backstage and says to me, Lester, I heard you last night on the radio, and she says it was great. I said, Mom, I've been doing eight shows, seven shows, whatever, at, at the Oriental Theater here. I says, it wasn't me. And she says, well, if it wasn't you, you should do something about it. Because she says, whoever it was is copying you. I says, you can't. You can't copyright, you can't patent what I'm doing, Mom. And she said, well, you ought to do something about it. And so I thought about it a little bit. And Mom is pretty sharp, pretty sharp. So I went to the Lou Levy, the manager of the Andrews sisters, and said, I'm going to give my notice. I'm going to leave the, the road tour. And Lou says, what are you going to do? And I says, I'm going out to L.A., lock myself in the garage, and I'm not coming out until I got a sound that is so different that my mom can tell me from anybody else. So mom is the one that caused me to leave the road tour to go out to California, and when Crosby and Rudy Valley and George Burns, when they called up Meredith Wilson asking me to perform and do the radio shows, I turned them down. I says, no, I'm busy working in my garage. Now, Crosby says, what's the matter with you? So he comes over to see what's going on. And I says, I told him about my mom. I says, my mom is getting me mixed up with other players and everything. And I says, I, I'm just looking for something different. Little did I know what I'm going to do is make up something new and different with multi-track recording. Now there was one thing missing, and it played an important part. And I said, I want echo. And I don't want a room sound. You don't want room reverb? I don't want room reverb at all. Okay. To put my mic in a hallway or in the bathroom was not what I wanted. So my friend Lloyd and I, Lloyd Rich and I, were arm wrestling at Santa Monica and Western in a little tavern, a little beer joint. And he pulled my arm down real easy. And he says, how come, how come you're not concentrating on what we're doing? I said, I'm still thinking about that, that, that echo thing. And he says, you've been thinking about that two years now. And I says, well, it's still on my mind. I says, it'll come to me. He said, explain it to me once more. And I says, well, it would be like if you were in the Alps. I says, and you say, hello, 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 hello. That's what I want. Okay. Oh, he says, you mean like if you put a, a pickup head behind the record head? I says, my God, you hit it, Lloyd, you hit it. And we go over to the, the garage, into the studio, and we just take a head, a photograph cartridge, put it behind the record head, turn it up, and we go, hey, 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 and it was born. On the disc machine, what we did there is I wanted something else besides echo. I wanted a flanging, I wanted to face the sound. So finally, I says, I got it. I got it. 
So I go out to the garage, and now you realize that I'm, I'm interested in all these unusual sounds, like the echo. Now we want a, a phase shift sound, in and out of phase. So what happens is very simple. I take and get an inductive motor and put a variac on it. Now I can set them so I make two copies of the same record and put one on one turntable, one on the other, and start them simultaneously at the same time. They're in phase. Then I took the variac and I would make it out of phase to in phase, and I'd get this thing shifting. And there was the sound, and I says, wow. Let's talk about um, how you did sound on sound and how it, from that point of the sound on sound, you developed the idea for multi-track recording. That's what I very much ah, OK. Well, in 1949, Bing says, uh, got something for you. And uh, he, it was at uh, 1514 Kursan, which is right on Bing's way home. And so Bing used to drop into my house a lot. And so this particular uh, afternoon, uh, Bing brings, uh, uh, brings me out to his car, and he opens the trunk. And we were on for Kraft, and then we switched over to Philco. So I thought either he's going to unload a whole trunk of, of cheese, or I'm going to get a big, monstrous Philco radio. You know, so I, he says, wait till you see this. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. So I, one of the two, Philco or cheese, it was neither one of them. It was the Ampex tape machine. One that's yep. sitting over yeah, there. That, it's right over there. And I bring it in the backyard. And we bring it in. Big as you know, Big and I, we bring it in the backyard and we put it on a stool. And I have a picture of it. We took a picture right then and there of it. And it must have been there an hour. And I didn't tell Mary about it. I didn't say anything except that I just played the tape machine and I'm with the discs that I have and I'm looking at this tape machine and everything. And the light lit so quick that I don't know. I just can't tell you why or how. But within an hour, I'd figure out how to make sound on sound. So I bring Mary out to the garage and I show it to her. And I says, now we can close the garage down and we can go with this machine. And when I alter this machine, now, she, now Mary's like my mother. Okay, Les, what are you going to do? And I says, well, I'm going to add a fourth head here, and I get involved technically in what I'm going to do. And so Mary says, but you don't know if it's going to work. Oh, I says, it'll work, it'll work, it'll work. OK. And so we start booking dates immediately. We are now left out of the garage, and we now can go on the road and do anything we wish to do, if it works. So Mary and I drive all the way to Chicago, and on the way to Chicago, with this tape machine, okay, I called Ampex before we left, and I says, I blew a head, can you send me another head? So they, anyway, they sent me the, the fourth head, the fourth head, and this head, I have to find somebody in Chicago. And all, all the way to Chicago, Mary's saying to me, but what if it doesn't work? I said, it'll work, it'll work. By the time we got to Chicago, I was beginning to wonder if, it, if it'll work or not, right? And so we're at the New Lords Hotel, and uh, in comes from Ampex the head. And I look in the yellow pages, and I find a guy that'll drill a hole in it. And so I said, I want the hole right there. In the deck. In the deck. So the guy drills a hole. And after he drills a hole, I said, geez, we should have looked underneath. <laughs> we probably drilled through half of the, <laughs> the wiring. We missed everything. <laughs> we didn't hit anything. We were the luckiest guys in the world. We hooked it up. We hooked it up. And I says, one, two, three, four, testing. Uh, howdy, 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 howdy. That's the second time now. See? 
Now to do that, I had to undo the fourth head and move it to the third head from the third head to the fourth head. In those days, you have to move it back and forth, you know, which head you're going to be on to do the multi. And on comes one, two, three, howdy, howdy, one, two, three, four, testing, howdy, howdy, and it works. And we're jumping up and down in the hallway, going to work at the Blue Note in Chicago, and the sound on sound was born right there. Let me ask you a question about how you recorded. For instance, uh, I know you did a lot of DI, direct injection, from the guitar through a transformer into the console, into a, into a preamp, and then into the tape machine. But when you recorded with an amplifier, what about the mic placement? Uh, oh, I never used, uh, I always direct. You were always direct. Did you ever use a live mic at all never. for anything? Never. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. No, uh, I found that uh, for what I was doing, I went directly in. And you prefer the cleanliness of that sound. And I went low impedance so that the guitar just goes right in. Oh, you converted with a, with a transformer from high to low? No, I just wound the pickups that way. Oh, you had low impedance pickups? Oh, yeah. Uh, my, I'm always low in pins, you know. There's the, there's yeah. the trick, right? I there. left high from, because uh, high, high. That came about very. Excuse me, came about Eddie. Came about real easy. Uh, I, I just says, what does the phone company do? And I says, well, they can run long lines. They can do these things because they got their act together. They, they know what they're doing. And so what I did is I just uh, took heed to what the other guy was doing. Uh, and and everything microphones. If you looked at a microphone, you don't see a high impedance mic, only in amateur land. And so consequently, I says, well, this has got to apply the same way. Every microphone that's of any, any good at all low is low impedance. And so why shouldn't the guitar be low impedance? Now I realize that the world out there was already stamped to high impedance. And that all these toys out there, all these guitars and everything, plugged in high impedance, high impedance, high impedance. And so the world went. Now, I wasn't about to change the world. What Just I was to do is that I was going to do <laughs> what I wanted to do for my application. And so I had only a 44BX mic for Mary. And I had two pair of earphones and this... Uh, uh, sound on sound machine. Yeah, paraphernalia that we carried around. Uh, with the 44 mic, I had to go in and modify the microphone because I wanted Mary to have lipstick on that mic. So Mary never was, uh, Mary was like this on that mic all the time. In doing the sound on sound, the thing that was most important there is not to lose quality. And in, in figuring out how not to lose the fidelity and the clarity, the least amount of distortion, all that. What we decided was to do whatever part that was unimportant, do that first. And so in, 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 in essence, what we did is make the recording backwards. And what we did is we would put the tracks on that we didn't care about, that were important, but they weren't going to be in focus they weren't going to be up front. And it wouldn't be up front. And so the part that were most important were put on last. So uh, with, with this happening, we were shooting How High the Moon and waiting for this moon to come around. And my manager walked up to me and I was lying back in a beach chair. And I'm looking up at the moon and he says, now what are you dreaming up? <laughs> right? And I says, great, you wouldn't believe it. But I says, you know what? I says, I just sit here thinking, I know how to make a multi-track tape machine. And we knocked on Ampex's door, Ponyatoff, the whole thing. Uh, Lindsay was there, the whole bunch. And uh, we had a big meeting. And they leaped on it. They leaped on it. And they say, yes, it can be done. Oh. And of course, uh, that was where the tape machine was made. And that in 1956, we'd already built the console to marry to the tape machine. And where the tape machine had its own selector system, we had ours built in the console.
The cell sync. The cell sync. Everything was remote from the console. So whatever we did, the tape machine took orders from us at the tape machine so that the, the engineer, me being the engineer, could do all this stuff right here, hands on. Another point that I want to bring up that relates to 1993 is that in 1956, you were sitting there at your 5657, sitting there with your first 8-track machine in the world, operating it yourself very much in the same way that a person buying an ADAT or a DA88 digital thing. machine can sit in his apartment or in his living yeah. room and do exactly the same yeah. thing, operated himse he, himself or herself. I think, that that's, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. I think the parallels are unbelievable. I, if I was to stand today with that eight track, if I held that in my hand, it would be like yay big, okay? Just hold it right there, and it does everything that this seven foot job will do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and do what the console does also. So you have a console and you have a, 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 a recording machine, a device that can do stand on its head. And it can all be done, uh, you know, with a flick the of a switch. Flick of a switch, yeah. What advice would you give kids today who are recording enthusiasts? The way I do it, the way I believe, is I never walk over to that machine till I know what I'm going to do. And I never use the machine to find it. I find it and then go to the machine and use it. I never let the machine tell me. I tell the machine what to do. In most cases, I may stumble across something in, in, in my ventures, but what I do do is that I find that whether it's playing the guitar, whether it's how I'm going to deliver a line for the audience, whether it's in hooking up a piece of equipment or anything else, that you're much better off to figure out exactly what you're going to do and then go do it. Well, I, I think with the kid, he's got to do that. He should know if he's talented and then go for it. And that, now it takes a, the more you know, the better off you are. And of course, the more you know, the less you know. The less you know. Yeah, yeah. It comes with the dinner. Thanks, Les. Yeah. Les, I want to thank you very, very much for letting us be in your home and in your studio in this wonderful place where history has been made and hopefully continues to be uh, made. I, hope um, so. I think kids of this new generation want to see what you've done, want to hear what you have to say. I think that without you having done what you've done, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, and not, neither would thousands of other people be doing what they're doing. Oh, thank you. So thank you. I um, feel absolutely uh, in awe, as I said, and once again, Eddie, thank, thank you. you so much thank for letting us so be much. here. We're going to go to our project studio where you will see a continuation of the history of Les Paul.